Breaking the wall of cancer's defense. How immunotherapy can become effective against cancer. Suzanne Topalian, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Baltimore. When the wall fell, I was starting my first laboratory as a principal investigator at the National Cancer Institute to study how to break down the barriers that cancers use to thwart immune attack. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to participate in this very exciting uh, event today. Uh, I'm a scientist and I'm also a physician, and what I'd like to tell you today is a story about how we've taken discoveries from the laboratory and moved them into the clinic to help break down the walls of cancer's defense. In 1971, our then President Nixon uh, signed the National Cancer Act. Uh, this designated a large amount of money to cancer research in the United States, and it symbolically launched the war on cancer. It also introduced a new scientific lexicon with many military metaphors. So we use words like attack, shield, smart bombs, missiles, and very relevant to the event today, checkpoints, which I'll describe to you. <laughs> now, the war on cancer has been going on for over 40 years, and let's fast forward to today, when immunotherapy is being heralded both in the scientific and also in the lay press as a breakthrough uh, in the war against cancer. What is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is using the body's own immune system to fight cancer, and this can be done uh, in many different ways. How did we get to this point more than 40 years uh, later? Well, one thing that happened in the interim is that we sequenced the human genome, and this opened the doors uh, to extraordinary discoveries. And so what we discovered about cancer is that an individual human tumor can contain hundreds to thousands of mutations. Very daunting for an oncologist to try to figure out how to, how to deal with this. And so the dogma became that cancer is a genetic disease and that we need to target these mutations, some of which drive cancer, uh, in order to cure cancer. But what we found was that cancer cells are very wily, and as soon as we block one of these mutations, another pathway comes up to continue to drive the cancer. And so drugs that target um, these pathways, this is called personalized medicine, can have dramatic impact, uh, but it usually lasts for only several months and then the cancer grows back. I would like to propose an alternative viewpoint, which is that cancer is an immunological disorder. The immune system should be able to recognize these hundreds or thousands of differences in the DNA components of cancer cells, and it should recognize them the same way that it recognizes virus or bacteria, and it should attack and destroy cancer cells. Why doesn't it do that? That's the question for today. But if we could devise a drug that would reactivate the immune system in the proper way, this drug would would become a common denominator uh, in cancer therapy. Now, the immune system is very complex, and in many ways it could be an ideal anti-cancer agent. Uh, this image, uh, this electron micros microscopy uh, image is showing you a, a tumor cell um, and T cells closing in on it, uh, trying to attack. The immune system has diverse weaponry, including different kinds of cells and chemicals that they secrete. It can very precisely target um, uh, very tiny chemical alterations, and importantly, the immune system has memory. Now, everyone in this room has been vaccinated against infectious diseases as a child, and we all carry that immune memory with us through life. What we would like to do with cancer is to prime the immune system in a way to educate it so that it can recognize cancer, defeat cancer, and recognize it if it tries to, to grow back again. With all these wonderful properties, the immune system should work against cancer, uh, but it's stalled by cancer cells uh, because cancer cells put up walls against immune attack. Uh, some of them involve regulatory immune cells, suppressive chemicals that these cells secrete, uh, but what I'll talk about today are so-called immune checkpoints, which are molecules displayed on the surface of cancer cells which thwart the T cells that are trying to attack them. 
PD-L1 is the name for a very important immune checkpoint that exists within the tumor. Uh, this is the first line of the tumor's defense against immune attack. What I'm showing you here on the left side of the diagram is the recognition event. T cells, the central players in anti-cancer immunity, recognize their tumor target, but this is only the first step. They then need to become properly activated so that they can do their job and eliminate cancer, and that's what I'm showing here uh, on the right-hand side of the slide. While they are activated, they already start to express these checkpoints, which are a normal mechanism to turn off immune responses at the appropriate time so that the immune system does not destroy normal tissue while it's trying to destroy foreign invaders. But what happens is when these activated T cells reach the site of tumor, if the tumor expresses the partner molecule for the checkpoint, in this case PDL1, that molecular interaction will turn the immune attack off. And so what we want to do with drugs is to block that interaction and rejuvenate these T cell responses so that they can do their uh, job in, in the tumor. Okay, so now let's move from a ball and stick model. What I'm showing you here is a section of an actual human tumor under the microscope. This is an example of head and neck cancer, uh, but it's representative of many different kinds of cancers where we can stain the tumor for the presence of this checkpoint. And here is the PDL1 checkpoint, and you see that it's right at the boundary of this nest of tumor cells with this attacking front of immune cells. And it really does remind one of an old fashioned phalanx, it really does look as if this is a shield against those T cells. And so if we could allow the T cells to penetrate into the tumor, uh, they should be able to do their job. Well, what we've found in the clinic is that we can use drugs blocking either side of the equation, either the PD-L1 or the PD-1 checkpoint. And these drugs can cause major and durable tumor regressions in several different kinds of cancers. I'm showing you here the percentage of patients with these different different kinds of cancers in which we've seen responses. And so here we have a single treatment approach that has an unprecedented activity spectrum. It's quite unusual in oncology to have one drug that has this kind of activity against so many different kinds of cancers. And I'd like to just show you some examples of what we've seen in, in the clinic. So the biggest eye-opener uh, for those of us in the field was the response of lung cancer to this kind of treatment. In the past, lung cancer had not responded to various various kinds of immune-based therapies, and we had pretty much given up on lung cancer. Uh, but because lung cancer expressed this PD-L1 checkpoint, we thought we will give this a try. And, and what you're seeing here is a patient that we treated who had not responded to four other kinds of cancer therapies before he came on this trial of an anti-PD-1 blocking uh, antibody. And here uh, on the left, you see before therapy, his lung cancer had spread to multiple different spots in his lung. After two months of therapy, these spots are on the way to disappearing. Here he is a year later with just scars at those uh, spots where there used to be tumor. Uh, and this fellow who had a life expectancy measured in a few months when he started taking the drug is now with us four years later off all cancer therapy and uh, doing very well. And what we found in lung cancer is that it didn't matter what kind of mutations the lung cancers had, they had the same response rate to anti-PD-1. And so this is indeed a common denominator uh, for cancer therapy. Now, anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 can also be effective against very large tumor burdens. This is a representative patient. It's not an isolated example. And in this CAT scan, what we're looking at is a cross-section of the abdomen. Uh, for those of you who are not used to looking at these, the head is behind the screen and the feet are uh, coming towards you. And here we see a very large kidney cancer in this patient's abdomen. And here we are six months later uh, with a major regression in this tumor, uh, which which lasted for several years uh, after uh, this patient started uh, receiving therapy. One thing that we noticed that is very unusual with other kinds of cancer drugs uh, is that the activity of these drugs can persist even after we stop giving the drug. And this gets back to what I told you about immune memory. We like to think that this indicates that we have actually reset the equilibrium between the patient and the tumor, and that the immune system is keeping the cancer in check. As you see here, this patient ended uh, therapy after eight months. Um, this patient with melanoma had 
multiple tumors in the adrenal gland, in the bowel, uh, and in lymph nodes. Um, we were at this point at eight months, and after the treatment was stopped and the patient received no other cancer therapies, you can see that all of those tumors are continuing to get smaller uh, many months later. Now, in oncology, the gold standard for new drug development is overall survival. Do the patients receiving the new drug actually live longer? We don't know the answer to that question yet because we need to conduct randomized trials with control groups um, in order to, to truly know the answer, and those trials are now in progress globally. But what I'm showing you here is encouraging information uh, in our experience with melanoma, and we've seen similar indications in lung cancer and kidney cancer, uh, that patients who were expected not to survive for more than a few months when they came on the study are now surviving one, two, and, and three years later. Going beyond the big, what we call the big three, lung cancer, melanoma, and kidney cancer, where we have the most experience, we're now seeing activity in other tumor types. And this is an example of a patient with head and neck cancer. Uh, very remarkable, because this woman is 96 years old, uh, and she tolerated the treatment very well, as do most of our patients. This is an outpatient regimen that's administered in, in the clinic. You don't need to be in the hospital for this. You can see how rapid the response of, of this uh, tumor was that had not responded to standard therapies. So now, uh, with, the, with this information, several pharmaceutical companies have jumped into this space and are all developing either anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 blocking drugs. And um, I've listed the companies who already have uh, these drugs in the clinic, but there are other companies that are developing their own versions of these drugs. Um, and um, what we have... Um, uh, actually been very excited about lately is, is that recently two of these drugs uh, were approved by regulatory bo bodies. So nivolumab uh, was approved uh, in Japan for treating advanced melanoma, uh, and pembrolizumab uh, from Merck uh, was approved in the United States for treating advanced melanoma. And uh, hopefully this is, this is only the beginning of what we're going to see now with more approvals in different diseases and different disease settings. So what is the future for this area of uh, oncology research? Um, even though we're helping some patients, we're not helping 100% of patients. And how are we going to get there? Uh, well, going back to the laboratory again, um, indications from animal models are that we need to use combination therapies based on immune therapies. And so where, where are we now? On, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you this um, uh, schematic survival curve, uh, looking first at chemotherapy and the targeted therapies in the blue line, we've made an incremental uh, advance, uh, but those patients uh, eventually uh, do uh, see recurrence of their tumors. With immunotherapy, now we're seeing durable responses, and what we look at is the tail on the curve, how many of those patients are still surviving months and years later. Uh, but the tail is not high enough. We want to raise that percentage. And so with combination therapies, where we would like to be is where the dotted white line uh, is, and, and hopefully uh, we will get there soon. So with all of this information, immunotherapy uh, is now becoming accepted in the general world of oncology as one of the pillars of cancer therapy alongside the traditional modalities of surgery, radiation therapy, and chemical therapy. And I hope I've um, shown you uh, today that there's a lot of reason to be excited about these treatments which can break down the walls of cancer. Thank you.